Welcome to workshop 213. Is the parish model outdated? With Bishop Gerald Wilkerson. Bishop Gerald Wilkerson was ordained a priest in 1965 and has a BA from St. John's Seminary in Camarillo and an MA in Sacred Theology from Catholic University of America. He was pastor of Our Lady of Grace in Sino and then was ordained Bishop of Los Angeles and appointed Bishop for the San Fernando region on January 21st, 1998. Please join me in welcoming Bishop Gerald Wilkerson. I lost my earpiece, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm not used to these uh, stage productions. Uh, and I do remember my name, so that's good. <laughs> I wanted to uh, begin today with, uh, with, with a reflection from the letter uh, to the Hebrews. And uh, it's in the 12th chapter and it says this, brothers and sisters, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings to us and persevere in running the race that lies before us while keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. While keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the leader and perfecter of faith. For the sake of the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross despising its shame, and has taken his seat at the right of the throne of God. Consider how he endured such opposition from sinners in order that you may not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. So uh, we are reminded in, in that selection from the letter to the Hebrews that we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And that really, I think, when we talk about the parish is, is very important to, uh, to keep in mind. I'm sorry that I don't have a lot of graphics and all that. I'm, a, I'm the talking head today. So you can, you can sleep and just open, you know, <laughs> close your eyes, but keep your ears open. Pope Francis said this, and this, it's kind of along the same lines. He said, faith is not something decorative or for show. To have faith means to put Christ truly at the center of our lives. So we're talking about the centrality, I think, of, of, of Christ. And it seems to me that as we look at what's going on in, around us today, a, a very changing world, a very challenging world, world that's becoming more and more secular, and we're, we're looking at all, and even Pope Francis is looking at all of the, um, of, of, of the um, organization in Rome, uh, maybe it's time for us to say, well, maybe we ought to get rid of parishes. Maybe parish isn't doing the job. Maybe there's a different way to do this. Maybe we ought to look at, at this whole thing in, in, in some other way. How do we really become relevant for the world today? Is the parish structure the best way to do that? Or is it really necessary? Um, can we find some other way to be church today? But given the fact that we still have the parish structure today, I'm going to suggest that we look at the focus of the parish. Rather than saying, let's throw everything out, throw out the, the baby with the bathwater, let's, let's say, well, we do have the parish. We know it, it, it can work well. Many of you come from parishes that work very well. Why? What's the difference between your parish and another parish that really isn't working? I, I walk into different parishes in this region every week, sometimes several times a week, and there's a different feel uh, in, in every parish. You've probably experienced that yourself. So what I want to say is this. It seems to me that if we decide we're, we're kind of stuck with this structure, you really can't throw it out and there's nothing to replace it with, um, that therefore Jesus has to be the focus of the parish's life. It's his mission that the parish has to be about. It's his message that we have to strive to communicate to others. It's his ministry that the members of the parish must try to extend into the world. And if that's not the case, if the Jesus dimension is not the central thread interwoven throughout all of the parish's life and activities, 
And if his gospel values are not the ultimate norm and criterion by which all decisions are made in the parish, then the parish is really little different in scope and purpose than that of a neighborhood association or some kind of fraternal organization. It's, it's more like the Kiwanis or the Lions or whoever, if we don't have Jesus at the center. Now, sometimes a parish has a lot of very successful activities. They may be very successful looking at it from a humanitarian or fiscal perspective. But if we fail in those activities to impart the life-giving power and strength and inner peace that Jesus alone can give and for which people today are desperate, desperately hungry and thirsty, then, then it's why? Why are we doing all of that? What's the reason? We, let the lions do it. Let the Kiwanis do it. Let the Rotarians do it. See, Jesus has to be central to the mission of the parish. At times, unfortunately, it seems that the person of Jesus gets lost in translation. Four or five years ago, all of our Catholic high schools and many of our parishes, as a matter of fact, were coming up with mission statements. And uh, the high schools particularly, not so much the parishes, but the high schools would often run their mission statement by me before they uh, made it uh, final. And I was amazed as I looked at those mission statements, and I agreed it was four or five years ago, that Jesus was seldom mentioned. In fact, the name of Jesus in many of them was not mentioned at all. I, I think that our better parishes do a great job of explaining the scriptures and our creedal statements and our moral positions. They do a great job, many of them, in sacramental preparation in advocating issues of social justice, of fostering a sense of service and community. But at times, our people, very well informed, well motivated, well intentioned, wind up acting more on the basis of, of knowledge or altruism or enthusiasm for a cause than out of love for the person. In other words, I suppose we could say that we are catechized but not evangelized. And I think that's what Father David was, was talking about in the workshop that just preceded this one. He's saying that the old evangelization, evangelization were, was for those out there. The new evangelization is for us in here, that, that somehow we have got to find where Jesus is in our lives. And I know that, that knowledge and information is very important when it comes to understanding our faith and our religion, but it's not the heart of discipleship. Discipleship is about the surrender of our life to Jesus as the person that we want to follow and imitate. And in this third millennium of Christianity, our parishioners need to know that it is possible to be a disciple, to give a loving response to Christ's invitation to come follow him. But only, only if we ourselves have truly met Jesus and responded to his presence in a personal way. Today's parishioners, then, must learn how to enter the mystery of Jesus, seeing how his life, his words, his temptations, his choices, his facing death, his overcoming death, how all of that relates to the demands of this day, to the needs of God's people, and to the fears of our contemporary world and society. Our parishes have to do a better job in helping people understand that Jesus is present to them here and now, walking the path of discipleship along with them. I think that to most people it matters little that Jesus walked on water 2,000 years ago and that Peter walked with him. That's kind of nice, but it's not today. But what really matters to them is to know that when they are sinking, this Jesus in whom they have put their faith and trust will lift them up. What matters to them is whether they can muster the courage to step out of the boat and into the storm of today. What matters to them is whether they can invite others to take bold new steps into unfamiliar territory with confidence in this Jesus. So pastoral leaders, parish leaders, must constantly emphasize how all of the parishes worship, faith formation, and social services are related to the mission of Jesus. The lector at Mass, for example, 
must be helped to appreciate that he or she is proclaiming God's holy word and that when this word is read with clarity, sincerity, and conviction, it has the power to touch lives and change hearts. The woman who was preparing youngsters for First Communion and the man who was instructing the confirmation candidates must recognize that they are not just helping out because there's been a decline in vocations to the ordained and vowed life, but they have to understand that this is a way of fulfilling their baptismal call to holiness and ministry and the command of their brother Jesus to go forth and proclaim the good news to the ends of the earth. The members of the pastoral council must appreciate that they not only have the responsibility to see that the parking lot is paved and the annual fiesta is conducted, but that they share responsibility for making the mission and ministry of Jesus tangible and real in this particular moment in history and in this particular place. And so too must the music, youth, Eucharist, and bereavement ministers, those preparing couples for marriage, those exercising the ministry of hospitality, those working the parish soup kitchen, food pantry, or thrift shop, those engaged in outreach to the, el to the elderly, the sick, to the gays and lesbians, to the unchurched, those teaching in our schools and in our RE classes, in our RCIA, everyone must really understand, truly understand, that Jesus is the center of all of that. And each moment spent, each gift shared, each contribution made is a real participation in an extension of the mission of Jesus himself. And it's only when this is fully understood that one's participation in the life of the parish, I think, can be transferred from a rather begrudging and perfunctory fulfillment of a burdensome task and responsibility into an exciting and challenging and spirit-filled adventure that truly makes Jesus alive and present in our day. So many times people say to me, oh, I'm, 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 I'm still doing this in the parish. And, and it's like they're tired. It's like they, they're, 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 they're sick of it, but there's nobody else. There's no excitement about our, our, our ministry today. There's no awareness of the, of the presence of Jesus. And I think that we're, that we're, we're not, it's not, the, it's not the structure, it's, it's the people who are part of the structure that must truly make a difference. Several years ago, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops listed the characteristics that are needed for healthy, mature, spiritually alive faith communities, parishes. And they said this, first, good liturgy and preaching. People really desire worship services which help them to pray well and preaching, which gives meaning to their lives of faith. Second, they said, the ability of the parish to help people deal practically with their life concerns, such as alcohol and drug abuse, poor schools in their communities, crime and safety issues, unemployment and job stability, and especially their concerns about family and children. Third, a feeling of ownership on people's part, a feeling that they belong, that their concerns are being listened to, and truly they've had the opportunity to affect parish policy and practice. And fourthly, an alive quality to the parish, the sense that, that something's really going on here, that there is something happening for everyone, that uh, the, the, the people haven't fallen asleep or haven't all died on the pews. There's really something happening, and that's exciting for them. And you know what happens? Sometimes the, uh, an old guard, uh, and I hate to use that word, but uh, they can kind of get a grip on a parish. Uh, maybe it's the parish council, parish committees, and they remain very content to go on with the tried and the true without realizing that the community and its needs have changed significantly sometimes, and without being willing to yield responsibility for parish leadership to those who have a better pulse on contemporary issues and what's going on today. I, I, I want to say a word, too, about uh, parish pastoral councils, which I think are absolutely necessary for a vibrant parish community, but which, for the most part, continue to be kind of, I think, in their infancy stage of development. 
And so many of our councils are, are mired in, in, in tensions over power and authority and control. And they're more concerned about winning these battles than they are about enhancing the mission of Jesus. So, for our councils to become the collaborative and visionary structures that they're meant to be, we have to continue our efforts to move them from strictly business boards to a community of servant leaders, from decision-making groups that happen to pray to prayerful communities that have to make decisions, from crisis management to long-range planning and stewardship of gifts and resources from parochialism to outreach, from rule by an elite group to participation and ownership for decisions by many parishioners, from we've always done it that way to creative recentering, from damaging conflict situations to a recognition of the need for healing, from a dualism that, that assigns spiritual matters to the priests, deacons, and religious, and temporalities to the laity. To move from that toward a shared responsibility for the total mission of the church by everyone. We don't divide it up. And, and the key in all of this, as always, is, is really pastoral leadership. Without the leadership of the pastor, first of all, who articulates and promotes a collaborative approach, that ideal cannot and will not happen. On the other hand, when our pastoral leaders empower council participation, and when our council members truly root themselves in the message and mission of Jesus, and devote as much time and effort to being as to doing, the result is that the doing is so much more effective, and the council experience itself is so much more enriched. And I would say that the issue of responding to the alienated the fallen away and the unchurched surely continues to be the number one challenge confronting our church and the parish. The critical question, though, is how do we respond effectively and constructively? And I, I think uh, Pope Francis in the last few days especially has said, you know, you don't respond by reading them the rules. You respond by becoming their friends and showing them compassion and friendship and love and mercy. And, and in that regard, I think that there are, are, are four movements to evangelization as found in the gospel. And there, there's four Greek words, koinonia, which means friendship. Secondly, diakonia, or service. Thirdly, kerygma, or the proclamation of, of the gospel. And finally, eucharistia, or thanks and praise. So evangelization then is first and foremost an exercise in communication and developing relationships. All communication and relationships have to begin, I think, with listening, with listening. Otherwise, we end up talking to and communicating with ourselves. You know, somebody comes and says, you know, I have this problem, and you, you read them the rules. No, you listen, you listen. So I think that, that, that we have to recognize that even if we get no farther than, than listening, than friendship in this process, that's the first, then we're, we are still evangelizing. We are accompanying someone as they're making their way, as they're growing more fully in, 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 in their relationship with the Lord. And when we look at the mission of the parish, we have to give special attention to our performance, I think, on those two. And I think we hear a lot this, I think we, we realize that we hear a lot these days about welcoming, uh, 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 about uh, being uh, hospitable. We hear that over and over and over again, and we've tried to even change the name of usher to hospitality minister. Try to change an usher, though, who's been ushering for 100 years is a little more difficult, but that's the goal nonetheless. And the problem, of course, is we say, oh, well, well, the ushers do that. And the response is, no, everybody does it. Everybody does it. I'll never forget uh, one time at Our Lady of Grace, I was uh, talking to the RCIA folks, and I asked this one lady, I said, what was it that, that made you want to learn more about Catholics? And she said, I knew I needed a faith community. And I was going from church to church. And she said, one day I came into your 11 o'clock mass, and I knelt down 
about a, a third of the way in, uh, into the church. And she said, I just did what everybody else was doing. And she said, I was so moved by the people, the way they prayed together, the way they sang together, the way they cared for each other. That's why I wanted to learn more about being a Catholic. So we're, it's the responsibility of all of us. And I think, you know, Father David was saying something along the same lines. He said, you know, when we go to church, we all have these long faces like, you know, somebody's died. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, we're celebrating the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, I remember one time a priest told me, he said it was Easter Sunday, and he had, that whole Holy Week he was exhausted. And finally Easter Sunday came, and he said the Easter Mass, and he was greeting people after Mass. And somebody came up to him, and he says, Father, Jesus has risen. Notify your face. <laughs> you know, so we, we do believe that, that Jesus is risen. And when we celebrate Eucharist, there ought to be some joy in that. There ought to be some joy in that. You know, uh, when Jesus cured the Syrophoenician woman's daughter, he gave the mother what she asked for. He raised up her daughter, and he sent her home happy. But he didn't say to her, I'll see you at the synagogue on Saturday. You know, that's the next step. No, he, was, he became her friend, first of all. He walked with her. He understood her. He showed her compassion. There's the beginning of evangelization right there. And I think the fact is that we can help people connect or reconnect with the parish and the church only insofar as we have befriended them and loved them. After all, God didn't appear to talk to us. God came down in the person of Jesus, and he lived among us. He washed our feet, he cried with us, he laughed with us, he drank our wine, he touched our world, and he especially touched the people on the edge, the poor, who today are those with no meaning in their lives and therefore the poorest of all. At the heart of the problem is a lack of relationships, both in terms of our people being willing to engage others in their search for meaning and of being confident that such an engagement is not so much a matter of having answers to questions that they may have or providing programs for their information and edification, but evangelization is a matter of being willing to listen, to understand, to walk with them in their spiritual quest. And so I'm convinced that through a person-to-person, peer-to-peer approach to sharing faith with others, we can break the quiet, reserved, privatized posture and the programmatic, programmatic response to evangelization that have tended to characterize American Catholicism. And we can offer, I think, a new dynamic approach to evangelization, one that is not coercive, that is not flamboyant or hysterical, one that does not engage in spiritual mugging, if you like, but an approach that comes from the love of the Lord and the movement of the Spirit within each one of us and that responds to the call of discipleship that's been given to each one of us. Go and bring the gospel to all nations. So in, in emphasizing this call to evangelization, I'm not unmindful of the problems, the difficulties, and the challenges that confront us. We are a sinful people. And we do live in a church that is ever in the process of reformation and renewal. And because of that, there are some who would maintain that the, t the time right now, it's just really not ripe for evangelization, especially in the wake of the clergy sexual abuse scandals. That we really ought to wait until either we personally or the church at large is in exemplary spiritual condition with all questions and doubts resolved and all living in perfect harmony. But as the late Father Alvin Illig, the great promoter of evangelization, so rightly said, he said, you know, for 2,000 years, the church has never been in perfect order and never will be. Christ told us to preach the good news of hope and salvation, but he also told us that there will be obstacles to plague our steps. If we wait for the perfect time, either for ourselves personally or for the church as a whole, we will wind up doing nothing at all. And I think that's true. Finally, let me just say that all of this, most of which you have no doubt heard before in various ways, will demand renewed determination, zeal, and enthusiasm on the part of each one of us 
because these are challenges that do not readily admit of facile solutions. And humanly speaking, we might want to cling ourselves to the status quo or retreat to the serenity of a previous age when life and ministry in our church seemed more stable, more secure, more clear-cut, to, to a time where there seemed to be consensus in the church, wherein roles were clearly defined, where answers appeared black and white, and where the ideological litmus tests, mean-spiritedness, and lack of civility that seem to pol polarize our people today and seem to poison the debate in our contemporary climate, when all of that did not exist. We want to go back to the good old days. Interesting thought. And while we can eliminate the ideological litmus test, the mean-spiritedness, and the lack of civility, because such have no place in the community of love, healing, and reconciliation that the parish is called to be, we cannot turn back the clock. We cannot hide our heads in the sand and pretend that the naughty problems and the perplexing challenges which God has laid at our doorstep do not exist. They are real. And the tensions and the ambiguity which they produce cannot be ignored. Too often parishes, you know, seem like gas stations rather than loving communities of faith and service. People pop in to fulfill an obligation or to get a sacrament rather than to gather around the altar as the people of God. The parish liturgical team prepares a great feast while many parishioners just want a quick bite before racing out to watch football or to go shopping or take the kids to soccer. And that's not surprising because today's urban and suburban territorial parishes, by and large, do not build on any natural sense of community. And even ethnic and rural parishes have often lost the close-knit ties that formerly bound them together. And while we in church leadership may see the parish as our primary community, many parishioners would place the parish far down the list of places to which they belong. You know, it would come after their homes, their schools that their children attend, the places where they work, their golf or country club, maybe even the neighborhood bar. <laughs> Where do, you, where do you find community? Well, it's way down there. It's, it's not the, the first thing. And this reality that for many people the parish is not the primary community in their lives could give us the feeling that we're failing. But as uh, the Dominican theologian Father Timothy Radcliffe notes, the archetypical Christian community was the Last Supper. Think what a dismal failure that community was. One of the disciples of the Last Supper sold Jesus. Another went on to deny him, and the rest ran away. Jesus failed to gather them into a community on that last night after three years of intensive formation, so we should not be surprised that we do no better than he did. What Jesus did was to offer the sacrament of communion, a sign of the kingdom that is to come as a gift in its own good time. If the parish is not a great and dynamic community, then this may not be a sign of pastoral failure at all. Sometimes, he says, we can do no more than enact signs of what is to come. So there can be those lows in parish life when it seems like everything has fallen apart. But we have to hang in there. We have to keep working, keep, keep going on. Jesus did not give up, and we must not either. And so, I think as, as Father Radcliffe suggests, the Last Supper is our foundational story. It's the story of God's covenant with us and with everyone. But the paradox of this story is that our community was founded just at the moment that it was in the process of breaking up. And that's been true, I think, down through the course of Christian history. At Pentecost, in the persecution of the early church during the fall of the Roman Empire, and the emergence of the Dark Ages, at the time of the Reformation to the Avignon Papacy, the collapse of the Papal States and the modernist controversy, and now in the face of the present crisis of trust and, and confidence created by the clergy abuse scandals. And just as at the Last Supper, the moment of betrayal and shame became a moment of gift and grace, Today's present crisis can be one of rejuvenation and joy. And I think we're hearing that from Pope Francis. 
Let's, make, let's turn this around is what he's saying. This moment can lead us to become a church where it is clear that Jesus came to call sinners, not the righteous. It can help us be a community which finds a place at the table for those who have been excluded by virtue of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and marital or immigration status. It can bring to birth a church that is less clerical and secretive and enable us to be a more transparent church in which everyone is recognized and empowered to exercise their full dignity as baptized Christians. It could mark the end of a church functioning, functioning as a sort of multinational business operating through a distant and unaccountable bureaucracy. And it can lead us to become more evidently a community of disciples. Most of all then, I think, we need to be a people of hope, for living and dynamic hope is the quintessence of the gospel message. Hope was more than a theme of the apostles' preaching. It was the very purpose of that preaching. For example, as St. Paul wrote to the Colossians, hope is the lesson you have learned from the truth-giving message of the gospel. Uh, the renowned theologian Teilhard de Chardin stated that the world will belong to those who can offer it the most hope. His fellow Frenchman, Cardinal Jean Danlou, put it this way, it's not that the world doubts Christians, but it is Christians who no longer believe in hope in themselves. We've given up. I think that's the huge problem of our day, it has been for many. Too often, we as Christians present to a world star for hope, not as St. Paul proclaimed, the image of a people uh, sure of who we are and what we stand for, but the image of a people more cowed by fear than borne up by hope. I, I would grant you this is a tall order, and that the battle against cynicism, discouragement, disillusionment, apathy, and indifference is a constant one. But the hopeful mystery of the death and resurrection of Jesus requires nothing less on our part. We must not give up hope. And for this to happen, we must grasp the challenges of the moment with the boldness of Jesus Christ. We must evidence what might be called evangelical daring. Evangelical daring is not power, it's vulnerability. It's not pure calculation, but simplicity of heart and trust in the wisdom and power of God. Evangelical daring is not a clenched fist, but open arms. It is what Archbishop Oscar Romero showed when he tenaciously proclaimed the good news in the face of deadly hostility. It is what Mother Teresa evidenced when she left her original religious community to found the missionaries of charity to work among the poor and forgotten on the streets and in the garbage dumps of Calcutta. It is what Cardinal Bernadine demonstrated when he forgave the man who accused him falsely of sexual misconduct. And it is what Jesus witnessed to when he accepted fully our human condition and transformed the scandal of the cross into the throne of glory. And it is what we must evidence if we are to be his faithful disciples in today's world. Seems to be it. it's also perhaps what uh, Pope Francis means when he says, uh, to us, he says, you know, he says, Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart to get in. And he's knocking on the door of the church to get out. Because we keep Jesus captive in our churches. The moment we walk out the door, we've forgotten everything that went on. We've forgotten who we are and who we're called to be, and now we're supposed to carry that out with us. Jesus wants to get out of our churches into the streets. That's what he keeps saying. Take Jesus into the streets. We have to, and, and I think it's the parish that not only helps us to do that, but is the leader in doing that. How is your parish taking Jesus into the streets? How is your parish getting Jesus beyond the door of the church? Good question. Now, we have a few minutes. I'll be happy to uh, just to uh, listen to any 
uh, feedback that you might have, anything that you might, would like to ask or kind of say, I think you're way off base, whatever. <laughs> my, my, my brain is working better at this moment than it did this morning when I couldn't think of Sister Edith's name. So we have a microphone here, so if anybody uh, wants to stand up and use the microphone. Does, it, does, does what I said, does it resonate with you? I mean, what, how, do we, how do we get our, our, our parishes today really to, to, to be communities of disciples? And, and you know, we, we've been, I, I once gave a, I, I gave a, a conference to the leadership in the Diocese of Boise, and just for example. And one of the things I, I asked them, I said, all right, um, there was maybe, I don't know, maybe 250 people in the room. And I, I said, if you feel comfortable, if anyone here in, in, the, in the room, if you have a, um, a parent or a sibling um, who has been divorced and remarried, w would you stand? And everybody, almost everybody in the room stood, including the bishop. And I said, now, how many of them are still practicing the faith? Oh, they don't come to church anymore because they can't. You know, they've been excommunicated. Well, what are we going to do about that? And, and how many in, in, in our gay and lesbian communities feel unwelcome in our churches? What are we going to do about that? And almost every one of us comes somewhere maybe further back in, in, our, in our lineage. Almost every one of us comes from an immigrant family. And there's some terrible things being said today about welcoming immigrants. Uh, what are we going to do about that? Uh, how, how do we... Is Jesus the center? I guess that's what it's all about. And uh, can we... Can we welcome those people? Can we extend the hand of friendship? Can we listen to them? Can we journey with them in their faith journey? We're, none of us is a finished disciple. We're all in process. Um, and, 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 you know, if someone is, is maybe way back there in the process, just making the first step, you know, and has some maybe wild ideas, are we willing to walk with them with the hope that as we walk with them, they will be, you know, the Lord will work in their lives and, and the Spirit will convert them to the way of Jesus? Or are we going to say to them, I'm sorry, that's not what I believe, and so uh, I, I, can't, I can't associate with you. It's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. Uh, but we have to be bold in our discipleship. And we cannot be afraid of different ideas and, and different personalities and different cultures and all of that. But, but, but what everyone needs is friendship, what everyone needs. And that's the first step of evangelization, very honestly. So anyway, yes. My name is Gloria Maria Mayo from Our Lady of Lords Church in Tonga. And um, I find that still uh, evangelization, I know this, this new evangelization coming up, uh, but evangelization is so very difficult, very difficult when so many um, fallen away Catholics, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, um, don't even want to hear it once you start speaking about it. I remember quite a few years ago, we uh, started evangelizing by uh, going from door to door in your own neighborhood, mm -hmm. knocking on doors, and I did that. And uh, that didn't really work that well. Mm -hmm. um, there were so many doors that were closed. Um, they listened very respectfully, a lot of them, a lot of them didn't. And now the new evangelization, um, I'm kind of fired up about it, but it's very difficult for me to make that step in uh, evangelizing. Sure. And, what and do you have to That's a good question. And I, I think that um, the, the, what's exciting about today, I think, is I think we have a new opportunity with Pope Francis because he's being reported widely in the media. And so a lot of those folks who were turned off to the church um, because we threw them out, honestly, 
we kind of told them they really weren't welcome until they got their act together. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, when we when we meet them now, they're saying, "Well, you didn't, you never wanted me, so I'm I'm gone," you know. And the, the door gets shut in our face. But I think Pope Francis is saying, and I think those folks are hearing it. He's saying, "Let's look at this again. You're welcome. We have to figure out how to welcome you." And I think those folks who had given up hope, I think there's a there's a, a light. A little light bulb that's been turned on in their lives. And I would think that the new evangelization and the, uh, the uh, approach of, of Pope Francis should give us all an op a new opportunity to meet those folks. But I also think that you will still meet folks that will say, you know, uh, I'm, I'm through with the church. I'm, I don't even want to hear about it. We can still be their friends. And, and I think that they don't want to be, uh, they don't want to be beat up they don't want to be put down, and they probably don't want to have anything shoved down their throats because that's what they remember from, the, from before. And so I think we can just say to them, you know, um, it's a new day in the church. Let's just be friends and see what happens from there. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I really believe the Spirit is working uh, today and that sometimes just that that soft opening <laughs> that says, it's a new day, think about it, you know, and uh, uh, maybe I'll see you next week, you know, or, uh, and, you know, uh, there, there's, a, there's a little pamphlet I have, I'll bring it back to you in a couple of months or whatever. Uh, whatever way we have to continue to the conversation uh, and to realize that, that that's, a, that's a journey. And uh, for many of them, it's going to be a long journey because they've been turned off for different reasons. So, but thanks, that's a good... Yes. Has anybody talked to the pastors? Yes. Has anybody talked to the pastors? <laughs> can, can anybody talk to pastors? <laughs> um, yes, we have indeed. And I, uh, I'm finding uh, among the pastors a kind of a new excitement as well. But remember, we're at the very beginning of this, this kind of new movement. And uh, every, every day, uh, uh, the Pope Francis has something different, you know, and so it's hard to keep up with him. But um, I, I think that it's, there's a beginning, there's a beginning um, uh, openness on the part of our pastors to do this. And, and that whole idea of evangelization, you know, here in this region, we've done a lot uh, with uh, evangelization. Uh, we have, uh, I, I hope to remember to introduce Kay, Kay Harter is our uh, volunteer director uh, of evangelization. Uh, and she's really done a great job. And she's been going to all the meetings, the deanery meetings with the priests, and kind of bringing them up to date. And I, I, I sense a new openness. And I really, I mean, I really do hear priests talking about how we can do this and how we can be more welcoming. It, it's, it's out there. Uh, but what I find with priests is there's so much put on them that, that sometimes they just, there's so much work to do that they, they just get over, overwhelmed. And um, so, but that's where we have to say to them, look it, you don't have to do this, we'll do it. You see, that's, that's the whole idea of, of, of uh, that, that everything doesn't have to fall on the pastor. When the whole parish becomes a welcoming parish, when the whole parish takes responsibility uh, for reaching out, for letting Jesus get out the door, when we bring Jesus into the streets, uh, it's not necessary that it has to be done by the priest. It has to be done by the baptized Christian, by the one who has been moved at baptism. We're, we're a missionary church. And we've forgotten that. You know, lots of people, I, I mentioned that, lots of people want to go back to the good old days, you know, when the schools were full, the churches were full, there were nuns in every classroom, the whole bit. That's not, that's not the first, that's not the first, uh, that's not where the church was originally. Originally, we were evangelized by missionaries who came from other countries to this land. And those missionaries, as they converted us, we then became missionaries to other places. And so, if you want to go back to the good old days, we ought to go back to those days. Because I think what we're called to do and to be is a missionary church. And how were we missionaries? You know, it's kind of like we've already done that, been there, done that, now we must be doing something else. No, we're always a missionary church. We're always sent to bring the good news. And how do we do that? No, friendship can be the first step, uh, an openness, even to say to somebody who was angry, to say, you know, Pope Francis 
has changed the, the approach, and we're really excited. I hope you'll, you'll listen, you know. It's a new day in the church. Come and join us, or, you know, be my friend, or whatever. I, I, I mean, let me, let me talk to you a little bit. Our, I know our kids, uh, our brothers and sisters, and all, so many that, that no longer practice. It, it's a new day. And I think, the, I think in a lot of ways the Pope has become, you know, the pastor of the world, the priest of the world. And uh, that's okay. That's what it takes to uh, create this new excitement, this new openness. And, uh, you know, I, I think that he's, he's not saying, okay, now that I, uh, you know, now, now that we've given you a bag of groceries, now you've got to come to church. That's not where it's, it's about. We need to do all of those things. But he, does, he says we do it because of Jesus who lives within us, the new evangelization. And he says we show mercy, we show compassion, we show friendship, we show love. It's not a, really not a new message, but somehow it got mixed up somewhere along the line. So I think it's a wonderful time for us. Okay, well, it's almost lunchtime, so that's, that's also good news. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. <laughs>